First of all, I'd like to introduce my co-panellists to you first. Um, I have Dr. May Myatt Cho, who is from uh, Myanmar. Um, Dr. May is a medical doctor. Um, she's currently a researcher at Mahadidol University in Bangkok um, on, on global health, focusing on non-communicable diseases. Prior to that, her main research area was in food and nutrition security. So it's a very relevant topic for her. Um, I have Mr. Dominic Egan, who is uh, from Ireland and also from the US. Um, he's a knowledge and learning and technology consultant, and he's been with the World Bank and various other organizations, and is a very active member of uh, entrepreneurial groups in both Bangkok and Washington, D.C. Uh, for myself, um, I'm representing today CIPS, the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply, which is a partner with AIDF, and also the largest professional body in the world for procurement professionals. Um, my background is very much industrial procurement for global uh, multinational corporations and also the public sector. And I'm also currently researching a PhD at Bangkok University in a joint program with George Washington University. The pitch tank idea was something that we did at the last AIDF UN conference earlier this year in Bangkok. Um, and the idea is to give companies a chance to pitch their products um, and their business to a group of people uh, who would represent stakeholders. So we could be a, a group of people that are interested in investing in the company or a group of people that they want to sell their product to, that they want to sell their business idea to. It's very much based on the formula of the um, Shark Tank television programme in America, if you're familiar with that. Um, we will give feedback on the product, on the, uh, everything that they present, and also the style of presentation. And it's hoping to create a more realistic situation, because in the real world, when companies do pitch their, their products and their services, whether it's to government, NGOs, or private industry, you only get a very small window to do that. So, without any more, I'd like to hand over to the first company that's going to present, which is Sanku. Thank you very much. My name is Felix Brooks Church, uh, and I'm from Sanku Fortification. Um, Sanku Fortification was founded to address the gap between large-scale fortification and uh, rural villages, rural communities that don't have access to centrally processed food. So uh, over the last five years, we've developed a technology, a solution, that's able to bring the fortificant that's at the large scales, bring that to the village level through uh, milling of flour, or any free-flowing food product at the village level. Uh, we have a, a, a short video here that I'll walk through uh, the technology and give you a bit of an understanding of how it works. So we spent five years, and the challenge was to build something that was robust and lightweight, uh, accurate, and could handle the harsh conditions of these rural mills. Uh, and we, we've achieved that. Um, we actually have a model outside at our, at our booth, so feel free to stop by after. So the device is built of all food-grade materials uh, and is designed, after surveying hundreds and hundreds of mills, it's designed to fit perfectly within uh, the common uh, hammer mill that's found throughout East Africa. Uh, there's no necessary modifications of the existing technology. and installation is quick, within five minutes, up and running, the miller is able to fortify his flour. Uh, and ongoing, there's minimal training required of the, of the miller. There's no calibrations, there's no daily adjustments. It's completely automated. Uh, and for, for a sustainable project, that was necessary. Uh, in the past, there's been methods of small-scale fortification by uh, what they call the hand scoop method, uh, manually adding fortificant to the flower. Uh, and that just represents uh, an array of possible human error issues with uh, homogeneity of the flower. So what we want to do is take out all the human error and have a completely 100% automated system that guarantees every day that that flower is going to be properly and accurately fortified. So, uh, yeah, it's lightweight, uh, so it doesn't damage the exi existing mill. Uh, it can be carried by one person. Um, it can be run 24-7, which is the case of many of these mills. They're running 24-7 and producing well over 24, 25 metric tons of flour per day. 
so it works on, on the range of small-scale mills all the way up to medium-scale mills, which is uh, roughly over 200 metric tons an hour. So the system is that a grain, there's two inputs. There's the grain and there's the uh, micronutrient uh, fortificant. Uh, and both are weighed and, and dosed at the front of the device so that homogeneity occurs within the mill as it's being ground up, pulverized, and out comes the, fo uh, the fortified flour. Um, and currently we are we're scaling up a project with our USAID in Tanzania. Um, and the fortificant we're using, we only work with partners that have been certified by GAIN. Uh, so we ensure the highest quality uh, and, and um, uh, low cost product. So it's a, st a sustainable program. Uh, and in Tanzania, we're adding folic acid, vitamin B12, zinc, and iron uh, with an addition rate of one to 1,000. So it's a very concentrated premix. Uh, so that cuts down logistics, that cuts down the cost of transportation. Um, and the other big challenge that um, has been with small-scale food, uh, food fortification projects in the past is how do you monitor all these mills? Um, and one of the great features of our device is the ability to store data, uh, daily, monthly, weekly uh, weight of grain versus the premix dosed. So accuracy can be re retrieved by a push of the button, either by the miller or, or a monitor, or even set up a system where the miller sends an SMS of daily, um, daily numbers to a remote station. Uh, and, and in the case of Tanzania, where you have an estimated 30,000 mills, you're not going to have 30,000 people visiting mills every day. So we wanted to make this scalable and sustainable, uh, and uh, we're very confident that we've achieved that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us. My name is Elliot Anderson, um, colleague of Felix's, and uh, David Dodson, the founder of Senku. I run the day-to-day -day operations of the business. I'll just talk a little bit about the business model. Uh, number one, and I think the most important um, note, is that we are a mission-oriented social enterprise. So our mission is to reach as many people and to provide fortification to as many individuals as possible. Um, that drives everything that we do. Uh, the enterprise portion of it is we are organized um, as an initiative of Project Healthy Children, uh, but we operate as a division and we manage ourselves as any for-profit organization would manage themselves. So we have sales, marketing, logistics, supply chain, chain management, manufacturing, quality, et cetera. Um, our, as you saw on the slide, our, our goal is to reach 200 million people by the year 2020. So we're giving ourselves about seven years to get there. We feel that represents about 20% of the need in the segment that we're going after. And we feel that that's achievable. And um, how we do that is we partner with existing NGO, government, nonprofit, and for-profit organizations in designing solutions in specific markets. So while we are in Tanzania currently, we have received inquiries in Africa from 22 different partner organizations in 11 different countries. Um, so we are um, in the process of evaluating what our next countries will be. Uh, Africa, there's certainly a lot of need in Africa, but India also represents a very large market, as does uh, do other parts in Southeast Asia. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentations. Um, what we'll do is we will ask questions first. The panel will ask questions, and they, they can answer, and then we'll throw it open to any discussions. Um, so first of all, Dr. May, would you have any questions? Um, I would like to ask what, uh, about the maintenance. How do you do the maintenance? Because um, you, uh, we might need technicians, and how do you cooperate with the local NGOs? How do you train them, or do you train them, or do you have technicians over there? Mm -hmm. So the technology uh, that we built, which you can go and see after as well, is a very, very simple device uh, with just one moving part, which is the feed screw. Um, so ongoing maintenance is, is minimal, if, if not necessary. Um, the training will be given to the implementing partner uh, that will give the, the miller secondary training. Um, in my experience, the mill broke down before our device broke down. So um, we're pretty confident. 
Okay, just on, on that subject, could I ask, what is the actual lifespan then of, of one of these units? What would you anticipate? We, we are anticipating to build it, um, or we are building it to last at least three years, and that's conservative. Um, so considering the cost uh, and, and the numbers that one device is able to fortify over the course of three years, it's pretty impressive. So you mentioned there about the cost of the unit. What is the, if you don't mind my asking, what is the actual cost of the units? Could you give us an idea? Well, it's a ranging price depending on volume, but we're looking at between 1000 and 1500 for uh, one unit. US. US. Not, the, not the 5 million yeah. that <laughs> was mentioned yesterday. So, so again, that, that's interesting because it, with a three-year lifespan and relatively simple maintenance, you're looking at an outlay of maybe three to $500 per year for, for using this machine uh, it, to, to fortify the product. Correct, yeah. which makes it attractive to be subsidised um, and partially paid off over time. Yeah, very good. Dr May? So also when, when you're talking about the, you're partnering with the NGO, what if they're local NGO and how, how, what is the cost effectiveness of using your mills? Uh, using your, sorry, uh, your, your machine? Let, let me just clar clarify for my benefit. Are, is it the cost of fortification for a, a, an end user? Is that what you're asking? Um, or No, because uh, the NGOs might be a very small one, local one. So uh, how, what will be the benefit? Um, so for ongoing monitoring, um, we've tried to, we realize that that's a big cost, especially when you look at the numbers of mills. Um, so that's why we wanted to invest in the technology um, put the money in the technology to minimize the cost of ongoing monitoring. And that's why we have the system of gathering data, storing data, and displaying data so that you don't need a monitor showing up to every mill now. Uh, monitoring, monitoring can be done uh, remotely. And that's the biggest cost of any small-scale program is going to be the, the upfront technology, the ongoing premix, and then the monitoring. And we've been able to cut down all three of those costs. If you're looking at actually manufacturing this and developing supply chains mm -hmm. to support it within the the units and, and fitting with that, that I think would be really good. Yeah, uh, I, I will follow up and give you a little bit more um, history. We, we looked at the model of local production um, and we felt as though in the Tanzanian context that um, the quality manufacturing, quality assurance, quality control, the quality of the, the welding, um, the quality of the assembly um, was not up to our internal standards. And we always think of it from you know, the user's perspective and from the buyer's perspective and um, representing the absolute best quality possible. So um, that's when we began diversifying our, our supply chain. Okay. Uh, Dominic, would you like to? Yeah, that was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. I thought you did an excellent job of uh, showing exactly what it does and how it does it. That was very concisely done. Um, one personal question I had was... Uh, I'd like to have heard about uh, how you originally decided on the need for this, uh, for this product and how big the, uh, for want of a better word, the audience for the product is out there. And, uh, and if you can answer that, tell us a little bit how you see it five years down the road, what, how, how much of that market you could reach and how you would do it. Yeah, well, the, um, the, the numbers are pretty big when you look at what population isn't reached by large-scale fortification. Um, and in some countries, it could be over 50%. Um, in, in the example of Tanzania, when you have the majority of the large-scale mills producing wheat, yet the majority of the population um, consumes maize, which is, done, which is milled locally, uh, right there, that defined the need, that we needed to get something out there that can fortify their locally produced um, uh, maize. Um, and two-thirds uh, two of the population is rural. That's about uh, 33 million people that are eating maize flour and now hopefully fortified maize flour. Um, so as far as a justification of the program, uh, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, where we see ourselves five years from now, we, we want to rapidly expand throughout the region. Uh, East Africa seems to be the hotbed of, of small-scale fortification due to the to the interest from the organizations, but also the ability to have one technology uh, because of the mills throughout East Africa are common. You can have one technology and one consumption pattern, which is maize. Uh, so the pieces all fit together quite nicely. 
So I, hope, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you raised an interesting point there. We've been talking, you were talking a lot yesterday and today about flour, wheat. What, what, and you mentioned this morning, other free-flowing products. What sort of products could you use this with? That's, that's a very good question. And um, uh, yesterday, my colleague uh, David Dodson was on the rice fortification panel. Um, and I think it's important to say that our device actually can fortify rice, not in the way that... that Perhaps the other pharmaceutical companies can, but uh, if there's milled rice, which is quite common, uh, into flour, our device can fortify that flour just the same way that it's fortifying maize, because it is a free-flowing product. So you can throw in millet, wheat, uh, sorghum. Um, uh, the challenge with cassava would have to be cut down into smaller particle sizes, but um, our technology, uh, uh, any grain of rice, it can fortify, making it diverse. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just uh, in summary, from my point of view, um, what I'm seeing is a very simple, robust piece of equipment that is a very innovative solution to, to a problem that's very affordable um, and that you've got a clear plan on how you can get that to a bigger audience. Um, so, again, thank you for a great presentation, for a very good product, and I wish you good success in the future in your developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.